Good morning. Good morning. We've got people still filtering in, but we're going to go ahead and stand together and sing. Glad to see you this morning. Let's worship in song. Prepare our hearts to uh, hear the message that's going to be brought.
to serve a God who never stops. He never stops working. We matter that much to Him. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. And you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God.
Amen. Y'all can be seated, Dr. J. I was just thinking that we we read the story of Lazarus and 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 then the young lady that was raised up. But Jesus did the exact same thing for us. I mean, if you look at that song, Amen. He called us when He saved us. He said, "You're not. You're going to live with Me forever. There's Amen. no. There's no need to even have a grave." Amen. And he rolled the stone away whenever he called our name. Praise the Lord. Amen. Isn't that good stuff? That's Thank right. you, praise team. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you here today. I'm glad we could come to this place and worship. I uh, am uh, a little taken aback by what I'm going to share with you this morning. I, uh, I have been preaching for a little over four years here. This, in fact, this is the end of my 50th month of being your pastor. And so I don't know that that's, that's praiseworthy, but um, over the course of these years and, and this time as being your pastor, I have uh, tried to help us make personal application of the Word of God so that we can understand how we can practically put into place these things that would not only make a difference in our lives, but would make a difference in our work for the kingdom. And so in my quiet time this morning, and I have a regular, I get a news feed, a quiet time news feed every morning. In that feed this morning, it was talking about what does it mean to love God with all of your heart, and with all of your soul and with all of your mind now conceptually we get that we understand that we are to love God with all that is in us and yet the issue for us seems to be that we need to be able to make that practical and so there are a list of six things that my quiet time reading brought to me. The first of those is that we need to have fellowship with Him. The word fellowship in the New Testament is the word kononia. And kononia means we have something in common. So you and I, because of the Lord Jesus Christ, have something in common with God. And that our lives should reflect fellowship with Almighty God. So the Word tells us about fellowshipping with God in Psalm 27. Also the Word tells us that you and I need to meditate on His Word. And so from a practical perspective, you and I need to be spending time in God's holy, inerrant, authoritative Word. Not just reading one verse and moving away, but seeing what God would say to us within the context of that verse. So the 119th Psalm over and over again talks to us about the application of the Word of God to our hearts that can make a difference in who we are and how we act. We are to be a people of prayer. And like Jesus, we need to begin our day communicating with God. You remember Mark chapter 1, verse 35, the Word of God says, And a great while before day, Jesus spent time with His Father. If it was important for Jesus to do that, it's important for us to do that. And so this prioritization of life is who we are as the children of God. Psalm 40 tells us that we should delight to do His will. That when we think about what God has for us, and God has a perfect Thing for you and me 
So we need to delight in spending time with God. Delight in His will as well. You and I need to understand and have confidence in Him because Hebrews tells us that He will never leave us nor forsake us. You know what that is? That's shouting ground. That's that place where we recognize that God is going to take care of all of our needs. And what does the Word say about that? I shall supply all of your needs according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And so you and I need to begin to make practical this idea of being a follower of Christ. I'm going to teach you a new word today. Theologians call this practicality orthopraxy. It's just a strange word that comes from the Latin that literally means putting into practice those things that we've learned. And God reminded me again this morning of the importance of practice in our lives, of following Him, of being the kind of person that He would have us to be so that He would be glorified through the body of Christ here in this place and as we go through our normal activities of the day. I wonder this morning before we have corporate prayer together, if there are those on your heart this morning that you would like to share with us so that we might pray for them. Robert, okay. And Kathy, thank you. Someone else. All right. Thank you, Miss Rose. Miss Joanne, we'll pray for Miss Roseanne and Lisa as well. Someone else. Frankie's still in the hospital. Amen. They're another working on days. medicine, I yeah. think. Yeah. Yeah. Another few days. Yeah. Amen. We need to certainly pray for Frankie and Jennifer. Someone else. Okay, Miss Shirley. Shirley Burris, thank you. Appreciate that. We'll certainly pray for Miss Shirley this morning. Someone else. Dad's blood count dropped, and he's in ICU. Okay, so Paul's in ICU this morning. We certainly pray for Paul and for Chad's mom, Sherry, as well, in the midst of the situation. Something else this morning. Others on your heart. How about unspoken requests this morning? God knows every one of those needs. Isn't it glorious today that we serve a God that cares about us? We sang about that already. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father God, we love you and praise you. We exalt your name above every name over all the earth. We recognize you as God, the King. And so today, Heavenly Father, only because of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross are we able to come into your presence that through that atoning work, we have been invited to come into your presence. And Father, today we come into your presence recognizing that there are those who have been mentioned this morning who have great needs. And so we would pray for Miss Nancy this morning and we would pray for Robert and for Kathy. We pray that you would do a work in that family and in their lives and that they might acknowledge and recognize that their ability to move forward is based upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, today we would pray for Roseanne and Lisa and for Miss Joanne as well. We ask your blessing upon that family and that home and those needs that are there as well. Father, we would pray today for Miss Shirley. We thank you that you've brought her through this far. And she would acknowledge if she were here today that it's only because of what you've done as the great physician that she's still alive today. And so, Father, we thank you for that. And we lift her up to you today. Lord, I pray today for Frankie and Jennifer. I ask your blessing upon them. I pray that 
you would continue to work through the doctors and the nurses as Frankie is still in the hospital. We pray that you would continue to bring healing to his body and that you would bring him home soon. Because we know already, God, that you have done a miracle in his life and that you continue to operate there in the midst of what's going on with him. We would pray today for our brother Paul. We ask your blessing on him today, Father. We pray that you would work through the doctors and the nurses. We pray that you would bring healing to him. We pray that you would allow him to go home and be with Miss Sherry in the midst of this as well. Give her peace in the midst of what sometimes can become chaotic. But our peace comes from you. And our peace is beyond our understanding. And that you, by your grace, dispenses your peace to us. So, Heavenly Father, today we thank you for worship. We thank you that we have already worshipped you through our praise. And we pray that through the remainder of this experience of worship, that you would be glorified, you would be honored, that every word that is spoken would bring glory and honor unto you. And that you would change us because we've been in your presence. We love you, God. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand together. Let's take a, a moment to, to welcome everybody this morning. Yeah. 
Messiah. Lord of all. Amen. Hallelujah.
Heavenly Father, we join you corporately. God, we, we join you together in this place. Lord, we sing about your goodness. Lord, in your word, your goodness will be preached today. And God, I pray that our hearts would be, would be open to receive what you have, have given to Dr. J to deliver to us. Lord, I pray that it would come straight from your heart. Lord, that we would, that we would reflect and change. If you have your Bible this morning, we're going to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 11. Now you recognize that we've not gotten through Joshua, but we have worked our way through the first six chapters of the book of Joshua. And um, as I was praying about where we needed to be and what we needed to be doing, God directed me to give you some additional understanding of the concept of faith so that as we go back to, in several weeks, the book of Joshua, we would be able to understand that God, in the book of Joshua, has given us an example of, about how we are to live by faith. And so I want us in our initial stages of looking at this idea of the nature of faith. And you would understand that the term nature means the basic qualities of something. In this case, it is speaking of the basic qualities qualities of faith. And so there are a number of things that we find in the context of the Word of God that would help us understand just what faith is. And the Word of God gives us a series of metaphors and you would understand that a metaphor is a word picture, that God then, through the Word of God, gives us word pictures so that we might understand the foundational truths of faith with the goal of being able to make application of faith to our lives and that we are not like what takes place in Joshua chapter 7. Do you know what happens in Joshua chapter 7? The children of Israel are on their way after conquering Jericho under the mighty hand of God. They're going to Ai. Which in comparison to Jericho was a tiny little place. And so God was leading the children of Israel to Ai. But Achan had ideas of his own. And that Achan wanted to take from the spoils that were gathered at Ai what God had declared belonged to him to himself, God to himself, not to the children of Israel. And so the children of Israel, because of their lack of faith, because of their unbelief, because of their unwillingness to listen to God, were defeated by their enemy there at Ai. And so from that example, what we understand is that my faith, your faith, has a profound effect not only on what God can do through us, but how successful we will be in doing those things that God has called us to do. 
So I want us to move to Mark chapter 11. Now for those who are involved on Sunday evening, you'll remember we are in chapter 13 of Matthew. And uh, that passage is called the Great Parabolic Discourse. It is seven parables given to us. And within the context of that, you will remember that God, through Jesus, Jesus gives us two parables at the beginning of that chapter, and then he interprets those parables to us. When we get to Mark chapter 11, what we discover is that there was a fig tree that Jesus cursed early in the chapter, and then Jesus cleansed the temple, and they were coming that way back to Jerusalem again, and they came to that fig tree that Jesus had cursed. And it was dead. And Jesus then gives them a picture of faith as it relates to what they are capable of within the context of that God-given faith that not only they were supposed to be living out, but that you and I are to live out as well. So I draw your attention to verse 20 of Mark chapter 11. And I want to read verses 20 through 24 to you so that we can see what's going on here and what the Word of God would teach us about this issue of faith. So look what the Word of God says. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And the spokesman for the group, Peter, and Peter remembered, remembering, said to him, said unto Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed is withered away. So Jesus answered and said unto them, not just to Peter, but to all those disciples who were there in that group going back to Jerusalem. Look what he says. It's fascinating that uh, Peter's talking about this, this act that took place under the hand of Jesus to curse this fig tree, and it was dead. And Peter recognized that and then brought it to Christ's attention. Jesus already knew it was dead. But look what he says. Have faith in God. So why? Why would he have said that? It, it almost seems out of place from what we've read thus far. But look what he says. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart. So two things. I would encourage you to underline, if you underline in your Bible, have faith in God. And then in verse 22, excuse me, 23, I would say to you, you need to underline, do not doubt, who does not doubt in his heart. Because doubt is the opposite of faith. Doubt is a hundred and eighty degrees away from the concept, the idea, the expression of faith in your life and in mine. And so at AI, Aiken, 
doubted that what God said was true. And he chose by an act of his will to do what he wanted to do rather than what God had ordained and prescribed them to do. God expects obedience from his children. And God expects obedience not only from you and me, but in the context of this corporate body of Christ here in this place, God expects us to be the people of God, doing the work of God and the will of God in all that we do. And so we see here in this passage, look what he says. If you don't doubt, you can speak to this mountain and it will be moved. Now, I believe that God can move physical mountains if he chooses to. And he can use people of great faith to bring about great and mighty works. But I also believe that everyone has been given a measure of faith, and the Word of God tells us about that. And that through that measure of faith that we have received, God wants you to exercise that faith and move those mountains that are in your way, that are keeping you from being the kind of individual that God desires for you to be as it relates to his kingdom and his kingdom's work. So look what else he says here. Does not doubt in his heart, but believes in those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he asks. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, the key is believe that you receive them and you will have them. So Jesus is giving us this picture of faith here in Mark chapter 11 that would prompt us to say that faith is a mighty living thing that produces wonderful works in your life and in mine, in our conscience, in our heart, in our will, in our mind, and even in our lives so that the believer can make a difference where God has planted them. So I give you that example to say that God wants to take those mountains away from you that seem so extreme that you cannot deal with them. But if you believe God, and you operate according to a belief system that is based on the Word of God, you can be successful in dealing with those mountains. Because God will come alongside of you in the form of the comforter and bring you out on the other side better than you were when you went in there. And so he gives us this passage to remind us that he wants to do exceedingly, abundantly above anything that we ever ask or thought in our lives. Then in 2 Corinthians 13, you don't need to turn over there, but in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, the Apostle Paul, speaking in his third letter to the church there at Corinth, declares to us that we are to examine ourselves to see whether or not we are in the faith. And so what that means is that you and I have been given the responsibility to assess the success of our faith in action. 
Paul tells us that in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, in the imperative. You all remember that that term imperative within the context of the Greek means it's a command. So God, in Christ, through the pen of the Apostle Paul, in the power of the Holy Spirit, commands us. He's not just telling us. He is declaring to us that if we are going to be successful in the Christian life, it means that we must examine ourselves. And you know what I know about examining ourselves? That when we look at ourselves, we will cease to look at other people. We will quit our examination of others because we'll see our deficiencies and see how we need to be dealing with ourselves rather than trying to direct other people in how they need to live goes back to what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Why do you seek to take the speck out of your brother's eye when there's a log in your own eye? And so our tendency is to bypass this idea of self-examination. And yet we're called on by God in 2 Corinthians 13 to examine ourselves to see experientially if we are living in the faith that is the faith, that faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is that faith that makes us victorious. We used to sing an old hymn years and years ago. The title was Faith is the Victory. And the chorus says, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. So I'll say to you this morning that we will not be able to be successful in life if we're not living, operating, working by faith. So here are those seven pictures of faith found in the Word of God. So faith, first of all, is a mystery. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 tells us that faith is a mystery. The second one is in Matthew chapter 17. And we see that faith is a seed. Number 3, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2. Faith is a principle. Number four, faith is a substance and a conviction. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Hebrews 4 and John chapter 6 declare to us that faith is a work. Number six, faith is a fight, according to 1 Timothy 6. And then Hebrews 4 once again declares to us that faith is a rest. So let me ask you now this morning to think about this idea of faith as a mystery. So 1 Timothy chapter 3, you will recognize that that Paul is writing to his protege, young Timothy, in both 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. So in 1 Timothy chapter 3, he's talking about servants of God. Specifically, he's talking about deacons, but he is including within the context of what's being said here that this idea of faith being a mystery is for all of the family of God and for all those who are servants of God as well. So the Word of God says, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. The word mystery in the Greek is the word mysterion. And we find that term mysterion 27 times it is used in the New Testament. So it is a significant word. And the word literally means that there is something that is hidden. And within this context, this word mystery means it's something that is hidden just under the surface. 
and going on with the definition we discover in the Greek that it says to us that this mystery is something that is to be discovered. Remember that part of the image of God that all mankind has received is an ability to believe. That we have been given individually a measure of faith. And so we recognize within the context of that faith, that latent faith, faith that is dead, serves no useful purpose. It is only as this mystery is revealed in the power of God's Holy Spirit and it is enlivened by God's Holy Spirit that we are able to put that faith into practice. And so when you and I think about that idea of faith, we would recognize that when we begin to read with eyes of faith, having been pricked by the Holy Spirit to see this faith in evidence and ultimately in action, it moves us from being an unbeliever who looks at the Word of God and sees only black words on white pages to the discovery of a living, active, sharper than any two-edged sword word that is revealed to us in the power of the Holy Spirit. So within the context of the Word of God, there is a word that many Baptists are afraid of. That word is rhema, R-H-E-M-A. And rhema is the word that is used that declares that God has given a personal word to us. Now, would you agree that we've all received, we who know Christ have all received a personal word? You know why? Because you ain't never going to get saved if you don't get a personal word from God. Right? Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We can't exercise that faith if God doesn't enlighten us through that personalized word, that word that he intended specifically for us. And so we then receive that rhema. And I am convinced that God desires to talk to his children. And so if we read his word, if we study his word, if we seek to understand his word, he will reveal that to us personally. That's why this living, active, sharper than any two-edged sword word can mean more than one thing to you. So you can read John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And yes, it has a primary meaning, but it also has nuances of meaning that are available to us through all of those words that are written there. And that through those words, God will use that word in your specific circumstance, in your specific situation, to share with you what you need to know so that you're able to navigate life that would be pleasing unto him. But it can only happen if we get ourselves out of the way. And so this mystery of the word has been revealed to us. So within the context of faith, there is a mystery. John Wesley put it this way. He said, the interior eye of faith being opened by the Holy Spirit. And so this mystery of faith is unfolded to us. And so you need to understand that every man, woman, boy, and girl has received the gift of faith. 
and that every person must determine by their own will whether or not they are going to receive this personalized word of faith from God to them in their lives as well. Look at the second one of these things. Faith is a seed. Go to Matthew chapter 17 with me. Notice what the Word of God says to us. You will know this passage when you get there. It is interesting to recognize what's being said here in Matthew chapter 17. Or excuse, yeah, my, verse 20. Do you remember this story? Jesus, in Matthew chapter 10, had empowered his followers. And he sent them out so that they might raise the dead, so that they might heal the sick, so that they might proclaim the acceptable day of the Lord, and that they might do mighty works, cast out demons. And they came back and said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. But this man in, in Matthew 17 brought his son to Jesus. Now, they'd just been on the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John. And so they bring this boy, this father brings this boy to Jesus. So this is what the Word of God says. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples. But they could not cure him. So Jesus had given his followers power why was he able to give them power because all power resided in him hebrews 13 tells us that jesus christ is the same yesterday today and forever and if he had all power then he has all power today power to take care of your needs power to change people's lives power to move us forward in faith and so he had empowered his followers Yet, there was a deficiency that kept them from being able to do what they had explicitly been called to do. Huh. What about that? God gave them the ability to do that. And then when they got in that situation, they couldn't do it. So look what Jesus says. And Jesus answered and said, I love this. Look what he says. Oh, faithless gener and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear witness with you? Bring him here to me. So he's chastising them for what? For the lack of faith, for the lack of the exercising of that faith that God had implanted in them. And so he says, faithless and perverse generation. And then he goes on and says, Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him and the child was cured at that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and said unto him, Why couldn't we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. Now remember, he had given them power to do that. But look what hindered them. It wasn't the power that hindered them. It was their lack of faith in believing that what God had called them to do was actually what they needed to do and should be doing. 
just like Achan at Ai. He was unwilling to believe God, to believe God for what he said, to believe that he was going to punish the children of Israel if they chose not to do things his way. So look what else it says. Because of your unbelief. For assuredly I say to you that if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. If you mark in your Bible, you might want to underline, nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. So he is declaring unto them, and, and just to give you an understanding of this, a mustard seed in the Middle East in the first century was basically the tiniest seed that would have been planted. And so Jesus talks about this mustard seed being planted. And that tiniest of seeds that is planted grows up to be a tree that the birds nest in. So a tiny, tiny, tiny little seed grows up to be a great tree. So if, in fact, our faith is as a seed or as a mustard seed, then what that means is that even the most minute amount of faith is capable of doing great things. Make sense? So God has called us to be a people of faith. And since we've been called to be a people of faith, then that would mean that the, the faith that God has given to us is all that we need to do what he's called us to do. And so if there are deficiencies, like there were in this story, it wasn't because the power of God through Christ was deficient. It wasn't because they had received that power and that they had that ability. What was the crux of it? their unbelief. So I am convinced today within the context of the body of Christ that our ability to reach the world for Jesus is based upon our unbelief. It's because we don't believe God. We don't really believe, and, and, I, and I say that to say that we only believe what we actually put into practice. So what that means then is you can say pretty much anything you want to say, but you only believe it if you're willing to put it into practice. See, it's easy to say I'm a Christian. Easy words. But it's another thing entirely when I think about how am I going to love God practically with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I can quote that verse all I want. But that doesn't make it a reality in my life. Yes, it is a reality because it's in the Word of God but it can only become a personalized reality to me when I am willing to put it into practice. So if I choose not to put it into practice, look what happens. My unbelief takes over. So what happens when your unbelief takes over? Well, God's not really in charge. 
and the world we're living in is falling apart. And you know what comes next? Fear. Because the enemy, just like he did with the children of Israel, provoked them to fear. They were afraid to do what God wanted them to do. And it can happen to us just as easily as it happened to the children of Israel. Look what happened to them. God brought them through the Red Sea. And because of their unbelief over in Numbers chapter 13, when only Caleb and Joshua brought back a good report and they believed the report of the ten spies, which was a bad report. And look what happened. The Bible says God still extended His grace. He gave them food to eat. He gave them water to drink. But an entire generation died in the wilderness because of their unbelief. So that, that generation had to die before the next generation could go into the promised land. So the Word of God declares to us here that that divinely implanted faith, enlightened in the Holy Spirit, equips us, prepares us to cast out, to bring in, to move, and to work. You see, we, we say that all the time when we, when we recite the Lord's Prayer. Remember what it says? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So I can talk all I want about the kingdom of God coming to the earth, but if I am unwilling because of my unbelief to be a part of his kingdom coming to the earth, what am I doing? working for the enemy rather than working for God. And so this idea of faith here that is a mystery, that is to be released, to be revealed to us, and that no matter how much faith you have, God has given you exactly what you need. Small as seed grows up to be a tree, and the birds can nest in it. But God has equipped us with everything that we need to do what He's called us to do. So I'm back to 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. We need to examine ourselves. And so this morning, recognizing that um, we cannot do what God wants us to do individually nor corporately without doing it God's way, without being a people of faith. You see, there's only two, two ways to go here. It's either faith or unbelief. It's either doing what God called us to do are doing something else. And what we've done is we have accepted and operated on that which is good rather than on that which is the best. God expects us to operate in the best. Because good becomes the enemy of the best and that our tendency is to settle with the good rather than to seek God's best I'm just going to stand before you and say it God wants to do in your life exceedingly abundantly above anything you ever asked or thought so in effect what I'm saying is is that God wants to do in your life and in mine things that 
pardon my English, you ain't never thought of yet. That are so far above where you and I are that if he revealed them to us today, we would be befuddled by how, how we would get there to do that. You know why? Because we're finite. And he's infinite. And he wants to do infinite kinds of things with his children. Things that have an effect on the kingdom. Things that make a difference in the lives of people. So today, I'm just going to ask you to examine yourself to see whether or not you are in the faith. And I'm going to pray and we're going to stand and, sing, stand and sing a hymn of invitation this morning. And I'm going to say to you, you don't need to talk to me. You need to talk to God. It's not about me. It's not about Jay at all this morning. It's about Jesus. And you need to communicate with Almighty God about whether or not you are in the faith. And you are exercising that faith. And you are believing God based upon the things that you're doing. Because His way is the only way. Let's pray. Father God, we bless you and praise you this morning. We thank you for your glorious word. We thank you that you provide everything that we need within the context of that word. And so this morning, Heavenly Father, I pray that your spirit would tabernacle with us here in this place. That we would come to a place where we see that we can do nothing, no thing, without you. Father, I'm reminded of what Jesus said, that he was the vine and we are the branches, and we who abide in him and him in us, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without Jesus, we come up to be zero on your scale. So, Father, I know it's, it's not about me. It's not even about us. It's about Jesus. So today, help us to assess where we are and begin that process of making whatever changes need to be made so that you can be glorified in our lives individually and in this church corporately. In Jesus' most glorious name I pray, amen. Would you stand please?
Psalm 46 tells us that as the deer panteth for the water, so my heart pants after thee. This morning when I was walking, there was a deer that was drinking water as far as I am from Kelly. And when he, uh, when he saw me, is a four-point buck, and when he saw me, he ran the other way just as quickly as he could. But he was desperate for water this morning and needed a drink. And so he put himself in harm's way so he could get a drink because a drink was that important to him. I, I'm afraid that we're just not desperate enough for God and that we need to be. Can you have birthday? Grant. Amen. Mm. 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 Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Grant. I'm sorry, I missed it. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. I haven't and many sung more that song how many times Grant. it just said, God bless you, and I... Grant. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's just you today, Grant, so there you Amen. go. He was waving at us. He was. Grant That's was waving was. at us from up there, yeah. <laughs> Any word before we go? Yes, sir. Thank you, my dear brother. You want to share? Childhood picture where we wouldn't be able to recognize you because it's going to be a game. Uh, you can get a, get those pictures by next Sunday. So we'll kind of get them put together. And then on the next slide, just before our legacy dinner, it'll be September the 16th, mm -hmm. 4.30 p.m., dinner and fellowship. I mean, you know, baby pictures are good because we all look better then. I did. I admit. I wasn't very tall. I was say I, you're about the same height. Yeah, pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> Let me share with you that next Sunday morning, Brother Guy Bankston from New Zealand will be preaching for us at this hour.